Right. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 2. We're going to read verses 22 to, 20 to 22 and then read over verse 44 in that same passage. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you would. Follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible with you, we've got the text on the screen for you. The book of Daniel, seeing Jesus in Daniel tonight. Chapter 2, verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. And then verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. This everlasting kingdom, the promise of an everlasting kingdom. The, we, we, if you remember, we've read in... Uh, Isaiah and in Jeremiah, particularly Jeremiah and Ezekiel, particularly the, the I wills of the new covenant. Listen to Daniel talking about what God, God, God will. He will. He will. He will. He raises up. He, he sets aside. This, this pounding reminder, repetition, that our God does what he does on purpose and he will not be thwarted by any man, any world system. It's a great way to live, isn't it, knowing that. What we read together, we read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let's, let's learn now from the, you can be seated, learn from the video uh, summary of the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, the story set right after Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem, and they had plundered the city and its temple and taken a wave of Israelites into exile. Among them were four men from the royal family of David, Daniel, who's later named Belteshazzar, and his three friends, who you probably know by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This book tells of their struggles to maintain hope in the land of their conquerors. The book's design seems pretty simple at first. Chapters 1 through 6 contain stories about Daniel and his friends in Babylon, while chapters 7 through 12 contain the visions of Daniel about the future. But this two-part shape is made even more interesting by another design feature, and that's the book's language. It begins in Hebrew, the language of the Israelites, but chapters 2 through 7 are written in Aramaic, a cousin language to Hebrew spoken widely among the ancient empires. But then in chapters 8 through 12, it goes back to Hebrew. This design shows how chapters 2 through 7 are a coherent section, but it also highlights the importance of chapters 2 and 7 for understanding the later chapters of the book. Let's just dive in. Chapter 1 introduces the basic tension of the first half of the book. Daniel and his friends, they're really wise and capable, and they're recruited to serve in the royal palace of Babylon. But they're pressured to give up their Jewish identity by living and eating like Babylonians and violating the Jewish food laws found in the Torah. So they refuse, and they choose faithfulness to the Torah, and it puts them in danger. But God delivers them, and they end up being elevated by the king of Babylon. After this begins the Aramaic section, which you'll see has this really cool symmetrical design. So first the king of Babylon has a dream that it turns out only Daniel is able to interpret. It's about a huge statue made of four types of metal and it symbolizes a sequence of kingdoms and the head is Babylon. But then a huge rock comes flying in and it shatters the statue and it becomes this huge mountain. Now this dream is the first of many symbolic visions in the book and this one introduces the basic storyline of them all. Daniel says that the statue represents a train of human kingdoms following from Babylon and they will all fill God's world with violence. But one day God's kingdom will come and will confront and humble the arrogant kingdoms of this world and fill the world with the healing justice of God's reign and rule. After this, chapter 3 tells the famous story of Daniel's three friends who refuse to bow down and worship a huge idol statue, which, like the statue in chapter 2, represents the king and his imperial power. And so the friends are persecuted, they're thrown into a fiery furnace, but God delivers them from death and they're exalted by the king who now acknowledges their God as the true one. 
After this come a pair of stories about two Babylonian kings, the father, Nebuchadnezzar, and then his son, Belshazzar. They're both filled with pride because of their imperial power. And so, like in chapter 2, God warns them both through dreams and then visions, which, also like chapter 2, only Daniel can interpret. He says that both kings are to humble themselves before God, and both kings arrogantly resist. So Nebuchadnezzar is stricken with madness. He becomes like a beast in the field. But then he humbles himself before God, and his humanity returns to him. He's restored as king. This is in contrast with his son, Belshazzar, who doesn't humble himself before God, and he's assassinated that very night. Now, these two stories draw this imagery from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and Psalm 8, where humans are depicted as the royal image of God. He's given them authority to rule over the beasts of the field and the birds of the air on behalf of God, who is the world's true king. But when human kingdoms forget that, when they rebel and make themselves and their power into a god, God, they become less than human, like violent beasts who will face God's justice. Which brings us to chapter 6, the pair of chapter 3. And this time it's Daniel who's being persecuted because he refuses to pray and worship the king as a god. And so like the friends, he's sentenced to death and he's thrown into a lion's den. But God delivers him from the beasts. And like the friends, the king exalts Daniel and praises his god. Which brings us to chapter 7. It's the pair of chapter 2 and the center of the book where all its themes come together. It's another dream, but it's Daniel's this time. And ironically, he can't understand the dream until an angelic messenger explains it to him. He sees a series of four beasts, one like a lion, then like a bear, then one like a winged leopard, each of these symbolizing an arrogant kingdom. And last of all is a super beast identified as a really evil empire. And it has lots of horns, a common symbol for kings in the Old Testament. And there's one specific horn who is an image of an arrogant king who exalts himself above God and persecutes God's people. Now they are symbolized by a figure called the Son of Man, who's an image for both God's covenant people, but also for their king from the line of David. But then all of a sudden, God, who's called the Ancient of Days, comes and he sets up his throne. He destroys the super beast and he exalts the Son of Man on the clouds where he comes up to sit at God's right hand and share in God's rule over the nations. We can look back now and see how all of these stories in the first half fit together. The three stories of faithfulness despite persecution, these are meant to offer hope to God's suffering people among the nations. But they suffer because human kingdoms have rebelled against God and have become beasts. And so these visions encourage patience, that God's people are to wait for him to bring his kingdom and rule over our world and vindicate his suffering people. But it raises the question about when God is going to do that, and that that's what these final three visions set out to explore. In chapter 8, Daniel has another vision about the final two beasts of chapter 7, but this time they're symbolized by a ram, who we're told is an image of the empire of the Medes and Persians, and then by a goat, who's an image of ancient Greece. And out of the goat come a whole bunch of horns, one of which symbolizes the evil king from chapter 7. And we're told more about him, that he will attack Jerusalem and exalt himself above God and defile the temple with idols. However, in the end, he will be destroyed by God, who will exalt his people and his kingdom. Now by chapter 9, Daniel is very puzzled, especially as to when all of this is going to take place. And so he consults the scroll of the prophet Jeremiah, where God said that Israel's exile would only last 70 years. So for Daniel, the 70 years is almost up. And so he asks God to fulfill his promise soon. But an angel comes and informs him that Israel's sin and rebellion has continued. And so their time of exile and oppression will continue on seven times longer than Jeremiah envisioned. Daniel is deeply disturbed by this, and he has one final vision. We're shown the same sequence of kingdoms. It's Persia, then Greece, and Alexander the Great, followed by lesser kings, all leading up to this final king of the north, who will invade Jerusalem, set up idols in the temple, and exalt himself above God. But then, all of a sudden, this king comes to ruin. Now, there's been endless debate about what all of these visions refer to. Many see a clear connection to the exploits of the Syrian king Antiochus in the 160s BC. He killed many faithful Jews in Jerusalem and set up idols in the temple. 
Others think it points forward to the Roman Empire's role in the execution of Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. And still others think it will be fulfilled in future events that have yet to happen when Jesus will return. Now the problem is that the symbols and the numbers, they don't quite match any of these views perfectly. But it opens up the possibility that in a sense they are all right. The book of Daniel has been designed to offer hope to all future generations of God's people. It did so in the days of Antiochus' empire, and it has ever since. This is why Jesus could use imagery from Daniel to describe and confront the oppressive leaders he confronted in Jerusalem. This is why John the visionary who wrote the Revelation could adapt Daniel's visions and apply them to Rome of his day and also all future oppressive empires. And so the point of Daniel is that all generations of readers can find here a pattern and a promise. It's a pattern that human beings in their kingdoms become violent beasts when they glorify their own power, when they redefine right and wrong, and don't acknowledge God as their true king. But Daniel also holds out a promise that one day God will confront the beast. He will rescue his world and his people by bringing his kingdom over all nations. And so for every generation, this book speaks a message of hope that should motivate faithfulness. And that's what the book of Daniel is all about. What these fellows do with, with this summary is just really, I think, amazing and incredible. And I think they nail it in terms of not getting bogged down in who does this represent and who does this represent. When we're told who it represents, we embrace that. But there's, we'll see as we get into this that there's ways to look at this that are designed to give hope to every generation. And if you remember, when we went through the Revelation, I told you then that the readers who read John's Revelation in the first century got hope from it. They did not say, wow, there's a day coming when folks are really going to get hope. No, they, had, they got hope then. When this re repeated theme of Revelation, this throne, there was a throne. I looked and I saw a throne. And so I appreciate, uh, particularly appreciate what they've done with, with Daniel. Okay, Daniel uh, is sometimes referred to as the apocalypse of the Old Testament. We used this word apocalypse before when we talked about apocalyptic language. Apocalypse simply means, in fact, if you looked at the, at the name for the revelation uh, is originally in its original language, apocalypse, apocalypsis. <clears throat> it means to open up or to unveil that which was previously hidden. And so Daniel is called the apocalypse of the, uh, of the Old Testament. If you just for parenthetically, Matthew 24 is called the little apocalypse in the New Testament because it, it, it speaks of things coming. Very much like Revelation says, I'll tell you about the things that have been, that are, and that will be. Um, and it, the book itself gives this, this majestic sweep of prophetic history. It talks about these empires, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, that they will come and go, that they rise and fall, but God will establish his people forever. N none of the things, not, not America turning away from God, not so-called collusion with the Russians, none of these things puts God's people at risk. God keeps his people and establishes us forever. Uh, Daniel, you remember, is a... Uh, We've already talked about this. He was carried off in the deportation in 6, 605 B.C. He and his, uh, his Jewish friends, Hananiah, Ezra, and Mishael, were taken. They were, they were kind of heads and shoulders above uh, their peers in the, in the eyes of the Babylonians, and they wanted to take them, uh, reprogram them, take the best that, that uh, Israel had, reprogram them and, make, and use them in the, in the life and the coming uh, society of Babylon. Um, it doesn't exactly work for Nebuchadnezzar as he had hoped uh, that it would and we will see you heard the reference in there that uh, that his friends were thrown into the furnace uh, they're, they're renamed Daniel's renamed these three friends are named Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego when I, when I read through this I, I I heard S.M. Lockridge preach uh, years ago. He, 
He was one of the first black graduates from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary where I went, and he, he's, uh, I think he's had a stroke. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but powerful preacher. But he would, t he would tell on occasion when you heard him preach that his mom named him Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Lockridge. Uh, you know, there's something, I mean, you can tell when she named him that she had expectations that he would stand for God, right, when he grew up. And he said he got to seminary and he dropped the Abednego portion. That's why he's known as S.M. Lockridge. He said, because people kept thinking I was saying a bad Negro. And so he veered away from that. Um, so he was S.M. Lockridge, Shadrach, Meshach. And he also said well, while he was in seminary, he lived in a little house right off campus there in Fort Worth and it burned down. And so he said, for a season, I was Shadrach Noshak until he got a place to live. So a great guy, wonderful preacher. If you ever come across his, his audio sermons on uh, any of these outlets that provide these, you need to listen to him. He will just bless your heart. Um, so you, you have these, these children of Israel. When we, uh, when we come and we see that section, it's instructive to me that they're thrown, the threat is to throw them in the furnace. And their response, if you remember their response, it is just so, uh, so powerful. They, they tell the king, uh, if you just want to turn over to chapter 3 real quick, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I want to show you this while I'm thinking about it. In chapter 3, verse 8 uh, and following. Uh, so verse 13, the king and a furious a rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. They brought them. Uh, said, is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered in verse 16. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In other words, we're, what we're doing in our God's sight is right. We don't we don't owe you an answer. It's pretty bold to say to the king, if this be so, our God, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. Now, you, it's important that you understand what's going on here. These fellows, it's not obvious initially, they were, they were claiming the truthfulness of the Ten Commandments. Specifically, uh, you shall not make unto yourself any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. When you drill down at that commandment, the, the, the force of the verbs of the Hebrew there say this, you shall not bow down to them, nor shall you be caused to serve them. In other words, you won't do it willingly, and no one can force you to serve them. And that's what they're claiming here in this passage. Verse, verse 18. But if, if not, if our God doesn't, he's able to deliver us, but if he chooses not to, be it known, we will not serve your gods. We won't bow down. Or worship. We're not going to be, no one can make us worship. They're, they're simply reflecting upon the commandments, which, which carry a, a uh, prohibition and a promise. And that's always been in, very instructive to me that, that they took the Lord. Of course, you know the story. Uh, they heated it up several times hotter than it would normally be. Uh, the fellows who prepared the heat died preparing it. Uh, they're cast into the furnace, and as the, as the spectacle is taking place, they look and say, didn't we just put three in the furnace? But I see four. And a fourth walking around like a son of the gods. And of course, we understand that reading back, that that's, that's one of those, we've talked about these, but one of those theophanies uh, the, from, the, from the compound Greek word theos for God, phaneo for face. That's one of those occasions where God, in the person of the, of the Son, before he is known 
in the incarnation as Jesus when, when, the, when the sun shows up in the fiery furnace. It's one of those occasions where you see Jesus ahead of time in the book of Daniel. Well, let's, go, let's get into the, to the uh, kind of a snapshot of it, and then we'll go down a little deeper. The place and time that this takes place, uh, it's, it's in, it's in um, Babylon and Persia from 605 to 536 B.C. It breaks down uh, under the, uh, the history of Daniel, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to, to 21. This takes in Daniel's background. This portion is in Hebrew. You, you heard the outline say this section is in Hebrew, this is in Aramaic, and this is in Hebrew. By the way, in some of the New Testament, Jesus speaks in, in Aramaic. Uh, as well, it's a, it's it's kind of kind of Hebrew, but Hebrew adapted to more of the uh, of the of the non-Jewish culture. Then, uh, the personal life of, of Daniel is is taken up in that section. Then the uh, chapters two to to the end of uh, of seven, uh, there's this prophetic plan for the Gentiles. God unfolds unfolds that to Daniel. He interprets uh, the dreams of of, of these. Uh, non-Jews, that's a section in Aramaic. Uh, there's visions of Nebuchadnezzar, there's visions of Belshazzar, there's, there's this decree of Darius, and then there's the four beasts. Then the, then the next section is the prophetic plan for Israel. And that is uh, in chapter 8 toward the end of the book. An angel gives the interpretation to Daniel's dreams now. There's the vision of the ram and the, and the he-goat, there's the vision of the 70 weeks the vision of Israel's future. So that's just a, it's a snapshot of the survey. I want us to go a little, into a little more detail now. Um, one writer that I read said that, uh, that Daniel presents in his prophecy a surprisingly detailed and comprehensive sweep of prophetic history. Um, he describes where the world powers are going to unfold, uh, really coming up into the, uh, uh, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Uh, then he, once he gets through that portion, he goes back to Jewish language again, Hebrew, to tell that. So let's, let's just see how this, how this works out for us here. Um, the message in these things is that the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans will come and go. Their empires rise and fall, uh, but God's kingdom is forever. I don't know how many of you do this at this time of year. This may be kind of something strange about me, but, but every uh, year around Christmas time, I break out Handel's Messiah, and I try to listen to it. And I'll, I may seldom get to sit and listen to all of it in one sitting, but if, you, if you've not accessed Handel's Messiah, I encourage you to do so by the, by the London Philharmonic Orchestra and Choir. These great the choruses, the great oratorios in it of, of soloists speaking about uh, the Messiah. And then you get to the, to the hallelujah chorus, which is kind of the, the apex of the whole thing. And the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And, he, and then they go into that, break into that, that antiphonal chorus where, where the altos are saying something and the, and the tenors are responding and the sopranos and the bass, it's just, it's tremendous. And one of the, one of the uh, works in there is worthy as the lamb and it's just overwhelming. So if you, I just commend to you for your listening, it's, 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 uh, it's sort of classical music, it's not typical hymnody, it's not, certainly not contemporary Christian music, but it is uh, majestic uh, when, you want to, when you want high and lofty thoughts of God and of Jesus Christ. And so I, anytime I study this, I just think about Handel's Messiah, and certainly in this season, I've already started listening to it, so it's fresh on my mind. Um, in, in chapter one, you kind of get, get background, some background on Daniel. It tells about his deportation, um, their challenge to eat the diets of the Babylonians. They, re, they reject that because as, as good Jews, uh, there are certain foods they avoid to maintain their Jewish distinctive. Uh, in, in their worldview, in their, in their Jewish culture, this would be to compromise who they are as the people of God, and so that's when all the trouble begins for them. Um, 
Nebuchadnezzar is surrounded by all these seers and, and these prophets and these wise men, and none of them can interpret his dreams. And so it, it falls to Daniel to, to tell him. Uh, and and you, you learn in this that, that when, when the people of God were taken captive, uh, there was a 722 captivity and then the 586 uh, captivity, which, was, which finally took the rest of the people of God and, and leveled uh, the temple, that this becomes what's known as the times of the Gentiles. I mean, Israel ceases to even be recognized as a people during this, this season. Um, there's a warning given in the vision of a tree. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar rejects it. And that's when he is sent grazing. Once you look at me at chapter 4, uh, this is amazing. People have asked, well, is this, is this a... What does this say about this man? But look at chapter 4, verse uh, 30, 34. He's, this is when he's come out of his humiliation, when God has humbled him and made him, made him like a wild animal, uh, grazing on grass, hair growing like feathers, uh, the fingernails growing like claws. I mean, it's, he, he must have been a spectacle and, and had to be a real dilemma for the people that this is their king out there doing this. Verse 34, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. Notice the, the, the sequence there. The lifting of the eyes to heaven is, is a man humbled before the God of the Jews. I lift my eyes to heaven. I'm acknowledging that the God of the Jews is God. Notice what he says about him. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the, the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? What do you, what do you think you're doing? When the children were growing up, we had a book we read to them from time to time in the, in the evening readings called The Braggy king of Babylon. I don't know if you remember that title or not. The, the braggy king of Babylon. And it just talks about Nebuchadnezzar boasting. Look at, and he did. Look at, look at this that I've made. I mean, I, look what my hands have made. The, you know, the hanging gardens of Babylon are one of the wonders of the world. And that's when God says, I've had enough. I'll give you some time to chew on this. And he humbles him in the dust. and humbles him into the field like a wild animal. So when he comes to his senses, he makes this incredible declaration that's, that even today some professing Christians will refuse to make. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven. This fellow is more orthodox about the, about the sovereignty of God than some of the contemporary charismatic leaders are. Who'd have you believe that they are God? That they become a God because of God's work in Jesus for them. So this is very, it's always been very impressive to me. Uh, and you go on and read in that, at the same time, my, my reason returned to me, this is verse uh, 36, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me, my counselors and my lords sought me, I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exult and honor the king of heaven. It's pretty amazing for a foreign king to admit. For all his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. He certainly knew that. I mean, he tasted that personally. The humbling, sovereign humbling power of God. And so you have, you have that going on. You've got the, uh, the next chapter and the feast of Belshazzar where, uh, where he, like his dad, is boasting about his greatness, and there's this handwriting that comes during the middle of a feast. Mene, mene, tekel, you farsen. And it means you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. And he meets his end that night, as he will not humble himself, 
And that, begin, that becomes uh, what one writer said uh, marks the end of the Babylonian kingdom. And in the reign of Darius, it follows, uh, there's a plot against Daniel where, where he's set up again and thrown into uh, the den of lions to be consumed. Uh, God rewards his faith. And Darius learns a lesson about the God of, of Israel. You have the vision of the four beasts and how they stand for, for, the, for the different kingdoms. But look at Daniel 7, 18. It says, The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. It's astounding that these leaders come face to face with this when they themselves rise up by putting down another, another empire. And so the, the, the book then moves from that. We're just doing, we're just doing a survey over here uh, from chapters 8 to 12 where uh, God begins to, to show his plan for Israel. And you have the symbols of the, of the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes uh, is the little horn. It's in this chapter, in chapter 9, that Daniel confesses. He sees that, that Israel has sinned against God. God's people have not acknowledged him. And we've talked about this many times on Sunday evenings, the cycle that is there. God blesses. The people receive the blessings. The people forget where the blessings come from. They sin against God. They rebel against God. They turn their backs on God. God brings judgment upon them. And, of course, this being in captivity is, is, is for them, the ultimate judgment. Uh, so he confesses on behalf of the people. It's a good, good example there. There are times when we should confess to God the sins of our nation, even because da Daniel didn't commit these sins, even if we have not committed the sins ourselves. Yes, God does judge individually, but you cannot, you cannot have your eyes open and your ears open and not see how God has put this nation under judgment. There's too many evidences of that, and so I think there's a time when, when we, his people, ought to come uh, in, in repentance before God and confess sin on behalf of just being a part of a nation that has been blessed, singularly blessed by God, and yet squandered uh, the blessings. And so God lays out a, a chronology uh, for the coming redemption and deliverance. In chapters 10 and 11, Israel's uh, future history is given. Uh, the, the kings of Persia and Greek and Greece, uh, the wars between the, the Ptolemies the, uh, and, the, and the, the Seleucids and uh, the Ptolemies in Egypt, the Seleucids in Syria, where, they, where these empires battle, and then Antiochus coming to persecute. And you know, through all of this, God's people will be saved out of these, these tribulations. These, these, the word tribulation is, uh, in the Greek, the ellipsis, it, it means in times of the squeezings, the pressure, when they come under pressure. So that's kind of a, a, just an a, a extended snapshot, maybe a, maybe a brief uh, video clip of uh, the book of Daniel. Let's look at the introduction and title to it. Um, his life and ministry cover the entire span of the 70-year period in the Babylonian exile. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, he was deported, remember, to Babylon at age 16, uh, along with his friends. Uh, handpicked, they were handpicked to serve in the court uh, of Nebuchadnezzar, hoping to groom them. Uh, you see the wisdom of that. If they could take Jewish, the finest of the Jewish young men, uh, weave into them the Babylonian culture, then they could, they could be bridges for other cultures and it would expand the reach of the Babylonian Empire. Um, an interesting footnote, nine of the 12 chapters in the book revolve around dreams. 
So there's a lot of visions here. Uh, they involve trees and animals and beasts and various images. And in all of this, Daniel is, is steady. He is consistent as he teaches the people and models for himself looking for God's guidance in this, praying for God's intervention, and acknowledging God's power in, in if I can use this and be understood, in, in moving the pieces on the chessboard. That God is behind all of this. The name uh, Daniel, Daniel, means God is my judge. And the book is named after him. And that's where we get our, our English title for it. It is surmised by writers who study these things uh, more seriously than we are doing here that, uh, that was apparently born into to noble Judean families. Uh, look, at, look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, what it says about them. These were youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the, of the Chaldeans. And so uh, these were the best of the best. These were the cream of the crop. He was trained three years in Babylon school. Look at Daniel 1.5. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. In other words, they were to serve in the king's court. That's the meaning of that. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's son, I want you to get, get a sense of what's, his son is Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar names Daniel Belteshazzar. It's very close to the name of his son. And it literally meant, uh, it, was, it was a, it was a prayer on behalf of the king. Bel, one of the gods of the, of the Babylonians, Bel, protect his life. And so you can, you can draw a conclusion from this that, that Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel some, some properties, some ways that he really had a, an affinity for him and a lot of hope for him, naming him almost the same except for, for one syllable as his own son Belshazzar. Uh, and you just will see some verses here. In chapter 1, verse 7, the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. And in chapter 4, verse 8, at last Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, and he, he tells the dream to him. Look at uh, Jeremiah 51, 44, just as a sort of a, uh, a comparison passage. The Lord speaking through the prophet, I will punish Bel in Babylon and take out of his mouth what he has swallowed. The nation shall no longer flow to him. The wall of Babylon has fallen. It's predicting what was going to happen when, when, when Belshazzar, at the feast of Belshazzar, defies God and meets his demise that night. God gives to Daniel this interpretive ability, uh, very much like Joseph. When you read about Daniel, you've got to be reminded of, of Joseph, how God used him. And uh, he serves in the courts of Nebuchadnezzar and of Darius uh, to help them understand the times and the seasons. I found this, and I thought this was interesting. He is one of the few characters, well-known characters in the Bible, about whom nothing negative is ever written. An upstanding young man. His life is characterized by faith and prayer and courage and consistency and, and a, an unwillingness to compromise. Uh, look at these verses. Chapter 9, verse 23 of Daniel. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. This is someone reporting to him. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. You are greatly loved. What a, what a great uh, description given to him in captivity. In chapter 10, verse 11, he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he spoke in this word to me, I stood up trembling. And then in chapter 10, verse 19, and he said, O man greatly loved, fear not. 
Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. In other words, your, your affirmation of me has, has encouraged me to, to, uh, to meet the task here. He's mentioned three times uh, by Ezekiel. We looked at that last week when we were studying Ezekiel, the three references to Daniel. He makes the claim in chapter 12, verse 4, uh, that he, he wrote the book. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall, shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And if you read through the book, you'll notice that there's times when he speaks in the first person uh, as, uh, as the author. Uh, and for external witness, if you need that, the Jewish Talmud uh, agrees. And Christ, in Matthew 24, attributed uh, a quote from chapter 9, verse 27 to Daniel the prophet. Look, Matthew 24, 15. This is in the little apocalypse in, in Matthew. We'll see that when we get to the New Testament. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. See, in, in Jewish literature, Daniel was originally in the, in the writings, not in the prophets, uh, because he didn't have the... He didn't have the same kind of call that an Isaiah did or a Jeremiah or Ezekiel. But it was, it was recognized, and Jesus had influence on this, that calling Daniel a prophet. But when was it written? I told you earlier. Uh, Babylon rebelled against the Assyrian Empire in 626 B.C. and overthrew the Assyrians in Nineveh in 612. I'll just remind you of some history here. Uh, Babylon then became the, the most influential and powerful empire in the Middle East when it defeated the Egyptian armies in 605 B.C. And it was during that time that Daniel was, uh, was taken captive to Babylon. Remember, Egypt had been sort of an ally to Israel. Uh, but when they were defeated, then Israel was really, was really vulnerable. And he subdued Jerusalem. I told you he functioned as a prophet for the full 70 years of the captivity. And he continued on uh, after Babylon was overcome by the Medes and the Persians in 539 B.C. He prophesied to kings, Nebuchadnezzar, his son Belshazzar, uh, Darius and Cyrus in Persia, and to the Jewish countrymen. Zerubbabel, one of the priests, led a group of uh, Jews to return to Jerusalem uh, in the first year of Cyrus, if you're trying to piece the chronology together. And Daniel lived and ministered until at least the third year of Cyrus, 536 B.C. People who study these things again make the observation that the book was written, no doubt, uh, by the time of Cyrus' ninth year, 530 B.C., and as was predicted by Daniel, the, the Persian Empire continued until Alexander the Great. Look at Daniel 11, 2 and 3 for this. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. That's, that's Alexander the Great. And this, of course, the, the Greek Empire was stretched out as far, as, as far east as to India. Uh, the Romans would later on, if you know your history, they would displace the Greeks uh, as rulers over the Middle East. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of this, but just to let you know that people argue, some, people, some so-called scholars, more liberal scholars, argue that Daniel is a fraudulent book, doesn't belong in the canon, it belongs in the Apocrypha, uh, because, and here's their argument, uh, there's no way that he could have known the things that he knows. There's, there's prophecy after prophecy after prophecy in Daniel that is fulfilled in these 69, 69 weeks or 69 years. So the, the, the prophetic argument um, makes that, that, that he couldn't have possibly known, that he must have been prophesying after the events. Now he's looking back and pretending to prophesy, but but they've already happened, which is, I mean, I, I could be that kind of a prophet, you know, 
to foretell something that's already happened. So they're, they're saying that it's, it's fraudulent because of that. Chapter 11 in Daniel, don't know if you know this, contains over 100 specific prophecies of historical events that came true, literally came true. So these folks who are left, left leaning say that he must have lived in the time of Antiochus Epiphanes around 175 to 163 BC, uh, several hundred years after we know historically that he lived. Um, there's a second, there's the linguistic argument. And it latches on to this use of Aramaic in chapters two to seven, that the Persian and Greek words uh, point to a later date. But as always happens, I don't know if you're familiar with this, and I've told you this through the years, just let the, let the archeologists keep digging over there and they will catch up with what the Bible asserts. Real quick departure, when I was in seminary, that was a long time ago now, but it was from 75 to 78. Not too long before that, people were saying there, there is, the, the, the narrative of the birth of Jesus has flaws in it because there, there is no evidence that someone named Quirinius was governor of Syria. This happened, of course, the, the, the great uh, census that took place. Well, they kept digging, kept digging. Sure enough, materials are found that cite uh, someone named Quirinius, who was governor of Syria, just as the scripture says. And so Daniel sort of falls into the people wanting to, to assume that this could not have been true. Uh, but what you find is that they've kept digging is that there was Aramaic uh, used much earlier than people originally thought. And Persian, uh, his use of per does not mean uh, that you have to date this late. And the Greek terminology used comes from musical instruments. So, uh, and one, one writer said this, he said, in the, he said, this would not be unusual, comes as no surprise since there were Greek mercenaries in the Assyrian and Babylonian armies that they would have used, had language crossing over. Then there's a historical argument um, that asserts that Daniel's historical blunders argue for a late date. But again, recent evidence has demonstrated that historical accuracy of what he said. I'll just, all you have to do is keep digging, keep digging. The, the archaeologists have never digged up anything that overturned what the Scripture says. They're always finding things that confirm what was already in the Scriptures. Inscriptions that are found at Haran uh, show that Belshazzar reigned in Babylon. Didn't know that, uh, hist extra biblically. While his father, uh, Nabonidus, was, was fighting and invading, the invading Persians. Look at Daniel 5, 31 to 6, 1. Just again, I'm just trying to give you a flavor of these things. At the end of chapter 5, beginning of chapter 6, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Right there in the scriptures, what's been discovered in more recent history through archaeology. In chapter 6, verse 1, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. Uh, and then there's you find different names used for them in different cultures. Well, let's shift gears a little bit to the, to the theme and the purpose. Um, Daniel was written to, to encourage the exiled Jews by revealing God's sovereign program for Israel during, the, the after, during and after the period of Gentile domination. Remember, revelation for the same thing. The first century Christians were suffering extremely under, under Roman torture. Uh, Nero, who sat on the throne of Rome, did despicable things to Christians in his gardens. They, they became his lanterns. And so revelation comes from the Lord through John the Apostle to give hope and encouragement. I looked and there was a throne and there on the throne was, was uh, the one who was, was faithful and true. I mean, there's all these encouraging images. The promise of, of the rider on the white horse in chapter 19. Well, that's the same kind of thing that you're getting in Daniel. It gives hope uh, for Israel during and after the, this days of the Gentiles, that they would come to an end. And though they would suffer, they would be delivered. This was not going to be a permanent arrangement. And the time would come when God would establish the messianic 
kingdom, which would last forever. Uh, Daniel repeatedly emphasizes the sovereignty and power of God over human affairs. Look at Daniel 4.25, the second part of that, of that verse. It says that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwellings shall be with the beast of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. This is the prophecy to, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And you shall be wet with dew of heaven. Seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And this, of course, is what Nebuchadnezzar came to recognize when he came to his senses in, in chapter 4, verse 34. And so the, the promise, the purpose here is that the God who directs the forces of history has not deserted his people, has not abandoned them. So they must continue to trust in him because his promises are true. He's promised to preserve them and ultimately restore them. And they're as sure as the coming of his king, the Messiah. What are the keys to Daniel? Uh, this, this idea of the word or idea is God's plan for Israel, that he has a plan, that he had, hadn't abandoned him, hadn't, hadn't abandoned his plan. They have no reason to abandon hope in him. The verses we read, I'll read them to you again. Daniel answered and said in chapter 2, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He, he changes times and seasons. Look, look at this picture of God's sovereignty. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. That's important for the people in captivity to know. That Nebuchadnezzar will only be on the throne as long as God allows him to be on the throne. By the way, that's important for us to know too. Kim Jong-un will only rule North Korea as long as God determines to allow that. And we will only be ruled in our country by people who uh, you just... Our politicians, I, I, don't, I don't have confidence in either major political party, and I'm not thrilled with the minor political parties. Everybody's, everybody's running to, to sip at the hog trough. Well, what, what, instead of being completely dismayed, you look beyond that and realize these folks will only be in power as long as God allows it. And he can take their breath away in a heartbeat if he so pleases. And so we live not hoping that, quote, things will get better, though it would be nice if things got better politically, but we live in the hope that God is sovereign over this too. He reveals deep and hidden things, verse 22. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells in him. So the things that we can't see that seem too dark for us, as we stand facing an uncertain future in different areas, he knows what's in the darkness. And light, he is light. Light dwells in him. And then in chapter 2, verse 44, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. This is the messianic kingdom. None of that's been derailed. The hope of Messiah should not be put aside because they find themselves in captivity. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And then the key chapter in this is chapter 9. I want to just pull some verses out of that for you. Um, this 70-week prophecy. Chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin. To finish the transgression means to, to finish uh, living out the implications of having turned your back on God. To put an end to sin to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. And it's also, because I've told you about prophecy, prophecy is proleptic. You have this, this immediate implication very often, and then this ultimate, ultimate implication. And that's what you're seeing here, this, that captivity will end, but ultimately God's kingdom will rule. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, that the word anointed one is the word for Messiah, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant. We've talked about this for, forever here, that God acts on covenant with his people. Make a strong covenant with many for one week, 
and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. One of the interpretations of this are many. But the message in it, the message in it, is that even though God has decreed that desolations will come, this is talking about when they get out of captivity, when they, when they, when they begin to reassemble as a people, they go back from the dispersion, that they will still face it. Uh, in 70 A.D., the Roman general Pompey would come and level, destroy the temple. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, a uh, couple of hundred years before that, would come into the temple and set up what's called the abomination of desolation. He would, he would offer, he would sacrifice pigs, all these things that Jews would not allow and, and make abominable the temple. So there's this, people kind of land differently and say, well, that's the abomination that causes desolation. So they well, uh, Pompey, general, Roman general did that in 70 AD. And then some say, well, it's the abomination that causes desolation is coming. Still, hadn't happened yet. So it just depends on where you, where you fall in, in terms of the influ influence of prophecy. But the message in all of this is that those things will happen. But the end in the end will, will be poured out on the desolator. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. And he will establish undoubtedly, beyond question, beyond challenge, his kingdom reign. So you have this, this chronological time frame here. Look at Matthew uh, 24. Again, in the little apocalypse of Matthew 24th chapter, verse 6 and verse uh, 15. Jesus said this. You will, he you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you were not alarmed, for this must take place before, but, but the end is not yet. We learn to recognize the times and the seasons. But certain things happening don't mean that this is the end. And verse 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, and then he, he goes on and teaches. So, so Jesus is referencing Daniel's prophecy for something yet to come. Okay. Um, as I've already told you, some, some see that as pertaining to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD or desecration by the Roman general. And I'm not going to unpack and solve the prophecy problem here tonight. Um, because I do think, uh, and I appreciate what the, what the folks said on the video, that that there's a sense in which people who come up with different interpretations, and I've seen this over and over, at some point they intersect, they interlace. They all, they all may see a portion of truth there. But I remind you, my professor, Dr. Thomas Urry, professor of New Testament and seminary said, it's called eschatology for a reason. Eschatology means the doctrine of last things. Don't, don't make the doctrine of last things first things. Read these messages in Scripture for the purpose they were written, to give hope, to give hope. And be content that what Jesus told the disciples who he had lived with for over three years, who he taught daily, it is not given to you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has placed in his own power. Then he goes on and says, let me tell you what is given to you, the gospel. What is given to you is the mission. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you shall witness for me. You be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And so, so we have to think in those terms. It's okay to wonder. It's okay to try to discover. But we need to avoid the danger of what some have called a carnal curiosity about these things. And recognize the message that is there. The message is the message they received in the, in the seventh century, sixth century, was don't give up hope. God's on the throne. His plan is unfolding. And he will deal with his enemies who have taken you captive. And he will return and restore you. And his Messiah will come to set up a kingdom that none of these empires will be able to take down. None of these empires will be able to challenge. And that was their hope, was to look forward to the day when Messiah would reign. Well, what about, uh, what about seeing Jesus in 
the book of Daniel. I already told you in the fiery furnace, you see him there, one like one, a son of the gods. Um, he's there with them. He's there with them. Daniel, uh, Christ is the great stone who will crush the kingdoms of this world. If you look at Daniel 2, we didn't read this a while ago. This was, this was in between verses 20 and 22 and, and verse 44. But look at this. Daniel 2, 34 and 35. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image of its feet of iron. There's your, your four uh, images in that statue. And clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. Get this image of these, of these kingdoms being destroyed and decimated so that you can't find a trace of them. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Reminds you of Peter saying, that the, quoting the Old Testament, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief stone. Uh, it's, a, it's a reference to the Messiah coming. And then verse 44, in the days of those kings, we read this earlier, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. And I can't read that without humming in my head part of Handel's Messiah, forever and ever and ever and ever. Then uh, he's also, in, in Daniel, the son of man who is given dominion by the ancient of days. This this powerful picture here. Look at chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The Ancient of Days is this appearance of him coming in the clouds. It is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord Omnipotent Reigns. Uh, I don't know if we have time to do it, but I want to challenge you. You need to read Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 sometime tonight, next few days. And you see in Revelation 4 this incredible picture of, of, of God. In Revelation 5, this amazing picture of the Lamb and the worship. When we get a taste for worship in heaven, this gives it to us. And so you see these pictures. I want to, I want to go on. Look at Daniel 9, 25, and 26. Uh, the coming Messiah who will, be, who will be cut off for a season. Look. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the, of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. We read this a while ago. And he talks about the, that they come to nothing, the people will come to destroy, and it shall come to it with a flood, and the end shall be war, and desolations are decreed. So there would, there would be this, it's, 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 wrap your mind around this now. They're hearing these prophecies. They, they're hearing the interpretation of these visions. An everlasting kingdom. But this one coming who have an everlasting kingdom will, will have a season when he appears to be cut off. Um, would come into you again. John Bunyan's classic, Holy War, the losing and taking again of the town of Mansoul, where you have this powerful allegorical description. He comes, he sets up rulership, he's, he's then, he's then uh, taken out, then he returns, he, he leaves Mansoul, he comes back. That, so they had to try to get a handle on and just trust God for that this everlasting kingdom where the one would come to rule in it would, would suffer uh, apparent defeat for a season but he would reign forever. And so th this was one of those great messages of hope. Uh, someone has said that it's li very likely that Daniel's vision in Daniel 10, 5 to 9 was an appearance of Christ. Let's, let's look at this in Daniel 10, 5 to 9. We're going to compare it to Revelation 1, 12 to 16. I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold. I want you to think about Revelation 1 now. Uh, from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze. And the sound of his words were like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. 
So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. That's, if, you, if you've read Revelation recently, you're picking that up. Well, let's look at it now. Revelation 1, 12 to 16. Then I turned. This is John speaking. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, white like, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. You can't read those two things side by side and not realize that God gave to Daniel a glimpse of the coming, conquering Messiah. And in, in, the, in the whole prophetic discussion of the 70 weeks, the 69 weeks and the one week, um, it points to, whatever else is teaching, it points to the coming of the Messiah. And I want, you, I want you to see this as we wrap this up. Look at Daniel 9, again, 25 and 26. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then 42 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. After 62 weeks an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. The anointed one cut off, see. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. And to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And this decree happened, if you were looking for a time frame when this was decreed, uh, one writer observed that it was, on, it was on March the 4th, 444 B.C., and he cites uh, Nehemiah 2, 1 to 8 for this. Let's just look at this. Uh, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, so you're piecing this together because you know a, a chronological timetable. When wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. This is from Nehemiah now. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you're not sick? There's, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. And I was very much afraid. And I said to, to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lie in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. The king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, we, we read this when we were looking through the historical books and getting a historical timeline. If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the rivers, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the forest, a fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city. And so you have this Nehemiah, in the, who's the, the rebuilder, uh, the restorer, uh, as they're coming back years later to, uh, back to the land of, of, of the Jews. And the king granted me what I asked for, for the good hand of God was upon me. I'm not sure whether to read this to you or not, because I don't, if you can't see it, I'm not sure it makes any sense. But it's a, it's a, it's a calculation that's been made about, about time frames. Taking the 69 weeks of seven years, uh, equals 483 years and so many days, and store starts breaking it down. Um, and that's, it's showing you how they get to that, to that particular date. I don't think that's helpful for our study tonight. What about the contribution? Daniel's contribution to the canon of Scripture, to, to the body of, of the Word of God. Well, we've, we've looked at these other prophets, and we're at the end of the, of the major prophets. Da uh, Ezekiel emphasizes the nation's religious restoration. Daniel concentrates his focus on its political restoration. Uh, clearly a prophet, but he, as I said earlier, he was not called to be a prophet like, the, like other prophets were. 
He does not uh, make public proclamations to the people as God's representative like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Because it is, the book is loaded with visions and, and apocalyptic literature, uh, you do track a symbolism and a, and a, and a, a oneness with Revelation, particularly in the symbolism. And people land, I've told you, some, some believe that it was fulfilled before or during the first century A.D. Others believe that portions are waiting fulfillment. Uh, they say that since the, week, since the, the events of the 69 weeks were literally fulfilled in, in the four kingdoms, the events of the 70th week will be literally fulfilled in the future. Uh, and I'll just say to you, I don't know. I don't know. I focus like I did in Revelation. I focus on the message of the book. The message of the book. Hope. Hope. And this was important. And I, I think, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I believe that believers around the world who are suffering persecution as we, we think about them every Sunday, every Sunday, keeping somebody before us, that these passages don't so much pique their curiosity as they do give them, give them hope. That when they are when they're outcasts in their culture, hunted like dogs, that God is on the throne. And by His grace, they may yet live to see on earth a kingdom established where everything that is against God falls like this statue falls and crumbles and it is blown away like so much chaff and they will see uh, the kingdom of our Lord uh, become the kingdom of his God and of his Christ. The kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of his God, of his Christ. And that's, that's the hope, that's the message of Daniel. In captivity, I don't know what you're struggling with, but you can find hope in the sovereignty of God. I'll tell you something, God's not sovereign, I won't rest well tonight because the world's spinning out of control otherwise. But if he is sovereign, which the scripture says he is repeatedly and he's demonstrated over and over that he is, uh, then we can put our heads on our pillows with a measure of comfort knowing that he has it all in control and he shall reign forever and ever. Questions or comments?